Good morning. Good morning. I am retired and part-time pastor Dale Hella. Your pastor Shar called me in the middle of the week and said, "Help! Our guest preacher <laughs> fell through for the week. Can you help us out?" And I said, "Well, I normally serve in English over at Hubbleton or Richwood, but I'm off this Sunday. I, I would have gone church there." but I preached last Sunday, so I said, sure, I can help out, and I'm glad to be here. I think it's my first time in this church, so it's a beautiful church you have, and a pleasure to be with you this morning. Otherwise, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, and we'll begin, I guess, with our opening hymn. So again, as I understand it, we'll be using the service of word and sacrament, which should be in the booklet which you have before you this morning. And please rise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity, but I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord have mercy on me, a sinner. God our Heavenly Father has been merciful to us 
and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord have mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Lord, how glorious is your name in all the earth. Almighty God, merciful Father, you crown our life with your love. You take away our sin. You you are the giver of everything good. Inspire us, your humble servants, to long for what is right, and through your gracious guidance, accomplish it to your glory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson for this morning is recorded in Acts chapter 9, beginning at verse... 36. In Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time she became sick and died and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged, please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm for this morning is Psalm 98. Part A.
second lesson this morning from the epistles is recorded in the first letter of John, chapter 4, selected verses. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Alleluia. for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel for this morning is recorded in John chapter 15, beginning at the ninth verse. The words of our Lord Jesus. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated for the next hymn. Lord of glory, you have bought us with your life, blood as the price. Never grudging for the lost ones, that tremendous Tis to give than 
to receive. Wondrous honor you have given to our humblest charity. In your own mysterious sentence, you have done morning as recorded in Acts 4 beginning at verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was with them all. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. And we pray, Lord God, Heavenly Father, sanctify us this morning by the truth. Your words from the Holy Scriptures are the truth. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, on Easter Sunday morning, the world changed for the better. It was transformed. It became different. For as of Easter Sunday morning, no longer were we damned by our sins. No longer were we condemned to eternity in hell. For as Paul writes, Christ was raised on that day for our justification, for our forgiveness, for our salvation, for our blessed hope of everlasting life. Because I live, as Jesus says, you also shall live. So, Easter Sunday morning means that someday your funeral will really be a celebration of life. And according to the words of our text for this morning, this truth and reality of Easter had at least two powerful effects upon those earliest Christians and hopefully upon us. First powerful effect, all the believers were one in heart and mind. And it was only a few years later that the Apostle Paul would be writing these rather pathetic words to the church in Corinth with regard to their worship in general and more specifically with regard to the celebration of Lord's Supper that when they came together as a church, he wrote, there were divisions among them, preferred members, cliques, one of those sad results of our sinful human nature resulting these days in at least 
six different branches of Christianity and over 40 different brands of Lutherans. And while I don't really know anything at all about the history of this congregation here near Deerfield, I have a strong feeling there has been differences of opinions over the years. Strong differences of opinions here also between God-fearing believers. And that's what makes this simple declaration about those earliest Christians, without any official name, by the way, so very amazing that they were one in heart and mind. A model congregation, as it were. Truly the communion of saints here on earth. One in their faith. One in hope. One in love, one in their worship, one in their plans, one in their outreach. So, to the extent that we are not one in heart or mind, or are harboring some grudge from the past, to the extent that we are not demonstrating our unity as the communion of saints here on earth, to the extent that we are not one in heart and mind in Christ. Let us pray to our Heavenly Father this morning for His forgiveness, a forgiveness He grants to us freely and completely for the sake of our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And let us pray in the words of Ephesians chapter 4, that God might instill within us the unity of the Spirit, that is to say the unity of the Holy Spirit, through what Paul calls the bond of peace, the peace of knowing that our sins are truly forgiven in Christ Jesus. And thus, by grace, may we always be one in heart and mind, to the glory of God. A unity that leads to the second powerful effect of Easter, an amazing effect which I had never really connected before to the truth and reality of Easter, insofar as our text says that no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. Now, this kind of really strikes me the wrong way. It goes against the selfish grain of my sinful nature. For you see, on the one hand, my possessions are mine. I worked hard for them, and so I own them. My house, my land, my car, my personal belongings, the money in my checking account, my savings, my retirement, my investments, what's mine is mine. But as you know, that's not really true. For in reality, all of our possessions are the Lord's possessions. For the earth is the Lord's, as the psalm says, and everything in it. Uh, the Lord loans it to us, surely, to be used wisely during this, our time of grace. But in reality, all of it belongs to Him. So again, to the extent that we've been selfish or greedy, not generous with others, not willing to share, and there's a plethora of reasons not to share, to the extent that we have not had compassion upon the poor and the homeless, or at least no more compassion than to say in the words of James, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed. No more compassion than those two church guys in Jesus' parable who simply walk by on the other side of the road. Then once again, we ask God to forgive us, which he does 
because of the boundless grace which he was willing to share and Jesus was willing to share on Good Friday and Easter. And thus by grace may we never claim that any of our possessions is really our own, but rather let us confess that everything we have is owned by God, making us ready and willing to share everything we have with others. Sharing our church, yes. Our forgiveness, yes. Our salvation, of course. As in the words of our sermon text, with great power the apostles continue to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But also, ready and willing to share our worldly possessions. So just as in the words of our text, much grace was with them all, so also may much grace be with us. Much grace, abundant grace, not, not little grace, not small grace, not barely noticeable grace, but rather and once again, much grace, great grace, charis, in the Greek, the undeserved love and favor of God. I once was lost, but now am found. That kind of grace. I was empty inside, but now I am spiritually filled. That kind of grace. I used to feel guilty, but now I'm at peace. That kind of grace. I came to know Jesus as my Savior, and now I'll never be the same. That kind of grace. Brothers and sisters in Christ, do you know Molly? Ever heard of Molly? Molly was born in December of 1906 died not too many years ago at the age of 91, a daughter of immigrants from what is now the Ukraine. Her father worked hard at a number of different jobs, but nevertheless Molly grew up poor, barely enough as a child to make ends meet. She remembers standing in line with her mother to get food and learned that it's possible for a father to work hard and full time and yet be poor. Eventually, Molly wound up working for the SSA, our Social Security Administration. And Molly was the first person to devise what we now call the poverty line or the poverty threshold. How much is needed supposedly for the most important living expenses. These days they say $15,060 for an individual, $32,120 for a family of four. About 12% of Americans, over 38 million people they say, live under this so-called poverty line. The poor you will always have with you, says the Bible. Way back in Bible times, so also today. More than likely, there are poor people among us, poor people whom we meet, poor people whom we know, but, but not back in the 30s AD, at least not among God's people in the church. Shortly after that great outpouring of the Holy Spirit on that great day of Pentecost, we read there were no needy persons among them, no poor people, no homeless people, no one living in a tent or in a camp. Moreover, there was no government assistance program for low-income families back then, no welfare, no Medicaid, no badger care, no food stamps, nothing. 
you were kind of on your own back then, unless perhaps you were blessed with family or friends. But back then, the church had a plan. God's people had a plan. Rather than separating themselves from the world by entering a abbey or monastery, rather than selling everything they had and sharing with their proceeds with the poor as a one-time event, this is what they did. We're told that from time to time, as the need arose, those who owned lands or houses, which probably meant back then you were rich, they sold them. Not, not all of them, but, but rather just some of them, enough to help with the current need. Then they brought the money from the sales, not just some of it, like Ananias and Sapphira, and they put the money at the apostles' feet, whom they trusted not to embezzle it or misappropriate it, and it was distributed to the poor as he had need, at least until the time of the, the great persecutions interfered. Some people want to call this socialism, the government or church taking part of what we have kind of forcefully and then giving it to others. And as time goes on, taking more and more and eventually taking just about everything. Uh, but, but that's really not what we have here, some kind of Christian socialism. For in our text, God's church does not forcefully take what God's people have, but rather God's people give what they have, they donate it, they contribute it freely, cheerfully, willingly, as a reflection and demonstration of God's grace in their lives. As the Apostle Paul declares in 2 Corinthians, each person should give what they have decided in their hearts to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Why? Paul answers, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich as the Son of God in heaven, yet for your sakes he became poor by coming down here to earth, so that you, a sinner, through his poverty as Jesus, might become rich, rich with forgiveness, rich with salvation, rich with everlasting life. And so when we combine this knowledge of our salvation with the knowledge that our God is the true Lord of everything that we have, it's the most natural thing in the world for us to share. A sharing that springs from that first most amazing Easter miracle that all the believers were one in heart and mind. Yes, the poor you will always have with you. It's, it's a great observation, and it's true. No matter how much you and I try to help, no matter how much society tries to help, there's always going to be the poor and the needy, the hungry and the homeless, those who live in an alley, or under a bridge. Yes, the poor you will always have with you. Can you guess who said that? Jesus said that. On that blessed day in Mark chapter 14 when he was anointed in Bethany, when the rather uncharitable observation was made that the expensive jar of perfume could have been sold and the money could have been given to the poor rather than poured on Jesus in such a beautiful, symbolic preparation for his funeral. Yes, the poor you will always have with you, replied Jesus, and you can help them anytime you want. But, as Jesus adds so very appropriately, you will not always have me with you. 
And so it is, brothers and sisters of Christ, that while we ought to be concerned and we need to be concerned about the poor, there exists in this world an even greater poverty, an even greater homelessness, that spiritual poverty of not knowing Jesus Christ as our Savior and not knowing heaven as our home, which is why your greater emphasis as a Christian congregation is sharing the riches of salvation, the richness of knowing that our sins are truly forgiven through faith in Christ, the richness of knowing that Jesus has prepared a place for us in heaven. Freely you have received, as Jesus once said, so now freely give of our spiritual wealth by means of the gospel, obviously. Freely give. But also freely give of our spiritual wealth. Wisely, generously, as the Lord provides us also with the opportunity. Freely give, freely share to the Lord's everlasting glory. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Uh, please arise as we confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son together is glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, have mercy upon us. From all sin, from all error, and from every form of evil, from the kind of horrors we see almost every evening in the news, good Lord, deliver us. From wars, crimes, and violence, from loss of income and from rising prices, from all viruses and diseases, and from all other trials and temptations, good Lord, deliver us. From early spring storms and severe weather, from damaging winds, rain, and hail, from all threats to our properties and homes, good Lord, deliver us. To rule and govern your church, to grant health and wisdom to your servants, to put an end to all arguments and divisions, to bring back all those who have gone astray, to bless the use of our offerings this morning, and to bless all those who receive your holy supper for the forgiveness of their sins, we ask you to hear us, O Lord. To beat down Satan under your feet, to send faithful workers through open doors, to bless the preaching and teaching of your word with power and success, to bless the servants of our missions and missionaries, to raise up those who fall, to strengthen those who are weak, to comfort those who are sad, we ask you to hear us, O Lord. To grant to all nations justice and peace, especially to those in Ukraine, Palestine, and Israel, to preserve and protect all those who are oppressed, to direct all those in positions of authority, 
and to bless our 2024 elections, we ask you to hear us, O Lord, to help all those in danger, to provide for those in need, to watch over all children and grandchildren, to guide our young people according to your word, to comfort and heal the sick, to bring unity and forgiveness to all marriages and families, to bless all those celebrating a birthday or anniversary this month, to bless all veterans who have so faithfully served and cause us to be thankful for their service, to provide for those who are laid off or unemployed, to bless our work together as a Christian congregation, we ask you to hear us, O Lord. To provide strength, comfort, and healing to all of your servants who suffer from pain, disease, advancing age, and all other afflictions, we ask you to hear us, O Lord. To forgive all those who have sinned against us, to help us use wisely the resources of this earth, and graciously to hear all our prayers, we ask you to hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God, you have taken away the sins of the world. Have mercy upon us and grant us your peace. Amen. Please arise for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace in Jesus. Amen. Amen. And we continue with the final hymn stanza. He is our